Hey, this is Scott Park Phillips, and this video is uh, an interview I did with Marnix Wells, the author of Scholar Boxer and the Pheasant Cat Master, and he's a lifelong martial artist. And I think it's a really interesting interview. I, I'm moving everything. The big news is I'm moving everything off of social media and onto Patreon because social media is dead. And I hope you follow me over there. It's at Scott Park Phillips is my Patreon account, and I'll put a link at the end. Um, this is one of four interviews I just did, and I'm just going to continue doing lots of videos and, and putting them over there. And really, that's what I'm putting my focus into these days. And anyway, I hope you really enjoy this. Uh, Marnix and I talk about the Pheasant Cap Master uh, about halfway through, uh, which is in, l like the Tao Te Ching is an ancient Taoist text. Uh, like the Chuangzi, and it's a he. It's he. He's the first person to translate this into English, so it's pretty interesting stuff. And we also talk about music, and we talk about uh, the 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 work he did, uh, the work I did <laughs> on in my previous book. He helped me with. He did the translations for me, uh, so we we have some uh, some history in common there. Uh, you know, Sung Jiang troops performing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, uh, and and I was hanging out at the sort of festival thing, um, as they were setting up, and it was very funny to watch the them argue over setting up the altar. There was this crazy argument, like no, it should be here, no, it should be there. They were moving pieces around. And, Where was this exactly? Uh, this is in in in, in uh, Taipei. In Taipei, yeah. Oh. And and they were and but they settled on it after about an hour. They settled on how it should be, and then they started playing drums, and I was like what is that rhythm? So I, you know, I was counting it out and I, I realized it was a, it was either a six, seven or a 13, right? wow. depending on how you count it. I thought, wow, that's a pretty unusual rhythm that they were playing. They, they were playing that later in the night too, for, as a, as a kind of stage thing. So I was like, oh, as a, as a, um, as a street performance, you know, accompaniment. Mm. Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting because, um, a lot of the stuff just is not written down at all and just happens to be part of people's... Well, the, yeah, sometimes they will have a, a score which frequently they're very secretive about. Mm. And, uh, you know, father to son, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, a bit, a bit similar to like some of the martial arts. You know, they, they, exactly, they don't like... Exactly like the martial arts. Yeah. And, as I would argue, because it was actually part of the same system. Exactly. <laughs> and another thing I should also mention, those Dunhuang scores mm -hmm. uh, for the pipa, or the, the, the lute, which, which actually came from the Persian lute, as, as our lute came from al oud, you know, which, which is Arabic. Right, and uh, the sound p and pa, right? Is that yeah, that's just uh, onomatopoeic. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, so down, up. But, um, yeah, the, the, basically the uh, the tuning system is entirely uh, from Persia, actually, mm. uh, and so this is part of the Silk Road uh, transmission, and you know, kind of, I think it's one can say it revolutionised Chinese music a thousand years ago, uh, but but of course it, they developed in their own way, but um, but I'm not sure how much we know about Persian music at that period. You know, other, other than the, you know, the, we know the, the tuning systems, but uh, when it comes to the actual music. Right. The, I, there's I, also I, the dance. There's also a huge, there are dance scores. Right. It yeah, done, which has kind of figured out, really. Really, there's dance scores at Dunhuang. I've never seen yeah. those. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think some of the British Museum has some. And um, they also have lyric titles. And so obviously they... It's all part of the same system, and they have a unique uh, dance notation. Uh, so you know that's a very interesting area. It is because dance notation is, uh, it's a it's, it's a strange beast. I mean, hmm. why why well, notation? it's based on it's based on sort of hand movements. I think. Oh, uh, oh, so it's a yeah. sign language, like so it's like sort of three of these, and then maybe two of those or something, you know, that, that, that's kind of how it works. Um, 
Well, yes, uh, right. In India, so in India, especially in, in South India, where they had the interactions with China, like Kerala area, yeah. Um, yeah. that the the sign language of of Katakali. Uh, mm. Hang on, I got a picture right here. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you know Katakali. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> they um they have a very extensive sign language system, so that would be quite easy to write down. Well, it's like the mudras, isn't it? It's even beyond mudras. It's 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 actually its own its own language, like, uh, but it's also mudras. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's like my uh, mudras and sign language. Yeah, well, well, obviously this is part of the transmission, uh, you know, from India and Persia to to uh, well, probably b both towards the east and towards the west. Right. There's no question. There were there were something like two thousand Chinese in. Uh, in North India, in the in the seventh century during the Tang Dynasty, um, they were they were there copying texts as like sort of official representatives or unofficial. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So the, yes, the exchange the exchange is really under under uh, and and I, I bring this up because I think my next project uh, is actually going to be um, showing uh, Tantric Buddhism mm -hmm. and Taoism mm -hmm. uh, and and the way they both line up with martial arts. Yeah. Because, because in Tantric Buddhism, you have this, or, or, or Vajrayana, you have this uh, uh, Nindra thing at the beginning, where it's like all the, this preliminary, which was, mm -hmm. which was kind of militaristic and was probably made for like teenage or, or young men to like mm -hmm. knock them through to emptiness. Mm -hmm. so then they could start practicing Tantra. Um, and that Chinese martial arts could, especially if we we looking at these early Chinese martial arts in, you know, in the 10th century or something in China, um, could very easily have been you know, a, a really fun, creative version of this, you know, do this really hard practice over and over and over until you bust through to emptiness. And then mm. we could start teaching you Tantra or what they called in Taoism, the golden elixir. And this wasn't straight Taoism, right? This was just like, this is like a sidecar. This is like something mixed that mm. doesn't, that didn't come through to us with a name mm. other than internal martial arts. Mm. But, um, but that itself didn't come with an instruction manual. It's just like, we got the arts without the story. Uh, before a contest, uh, there was very like just like in Thailand today, you know, before before the match, they they will perform a ritual dance on the, on the um, in the ring. So um, I guess this kind of thing would have been prevalent <clears throat> throughout China as well. Hey, thanks for listening. You can catch the whole rest of this video over on Patreon, and check out my books on Amazon.com.